Anyway, it's good to be here. It's good to be here this week. Um, um, I appreciate the opportunity to come and share with you uh, from the Word this evening. And uh, let me just start this. And um, to share with you, although he said I could preach till 10 o'clock, didn't he? <laughs> um, uh, it's great to be here this week, and I'm glad for the opportunity to share with you just a few thoughts from God's Word um, this evening. And um, it is a privilege to be here. You know, I was sitting thinking earlier today that, you know, we're among fellow brothers and sisters, and I didn't get to spend time with each one of you this week, but there's a, quite a number of folks that I get to spend time with. And one of, the, one of the things I really appreciated about, you know, especially this week and uh, the time here is that um, there's like-minded believers that we fellowship with. Not, I'm not, I'm not um, share, rubbing my shoulders with somebody that's got an ta- uh, ulterior motive, motive, a motive um, you know, to catch me out, to do something. But I saw what I saw was a lot of people here um, really excited about the truth of God's Word and wanting to know the truth of God's Word and making sure that goes out, you know. And I appreciate that, you know. It's, um, you know, it's not a nice atmosphere when you're always with somebody that's always checking you and, you know, policing you. But the issue is the truth of God's Word. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate this conference and this ministry here. So we're thankful to be here. I did bring greetings to you already from the church, our church, Graceway Bible Church in um, Edgewater, Florida. And also um, from the church in... Um, Port Elizabeth in South Africa has asked me specifically to give greetings, and also the churches in Kenya has asked me to agree to convey their greetings to you as well this evening. And before I get going um, in this passage, you can turn with me to Second Corinthians chapter five, so long if you like. Second Corinthians chapter five. <coughs> but I, I came here this week. I arrived, and um, and after the first, I realized, whoops, you know what? I didn't bring my belt. But you can see I have a belt on this evening. And um, you see the belt? <laughs> now, this belt has been supplied by um, the, 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 the local clothing supplier. Um, and the store is called um, the Ray Keeble <laughs> Outfitters. And um, he's outfitted Ted, what, uh, Ted uh, Fellows this week. And I have a belt, and I feel... Uh, you know what? I really feel special with this belt. It feels good, you know. <laughs> but he told me to, to remember to give his belt back to him. So, anyway, um, we appreciate you, all you guys here. Second Corinthians chapter five. My message this evening is taking God's grace um, to the world. Taking God's grace to the world. And uh, my 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 the challenge has been given to me. This the statement, um, the purpose statement given to me as a challenge to renew our commitment to personal soul winning, soul winning and local church-based evangelism. And so what we want to do this evening is talk about the charge to renew our minds and to get active involved in, in, um, in sharing the gospel with people and also, also and our local churches be the base of operations from which we operate as we go out to get the gospel out to people. So let's just open up. And as, we, as uh, we start reading from Second Corinthians chapter 5, if you will, and I'm going to read from verse 14 to the end of the chapter there. For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if, if one died for all, then we're all dead, and that he died for all, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away, behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation." To wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God would beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God." 
For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Amen. Father, we thank you this evening for an opportunity again to open your word, to consider a few verses, and to consider your word in the scriptures. We thank you as we consider your word, you give us the understanding in all things. And we thank you for the fellowship of the saints here. Above all, we thank you for the righteousness, your righteousness that we, you've been made us to be in, in Christ. And we thank you for making us accepted in the beloved. We praise you and we thank you for these things by Christ Jesus alone. Amen. Um, in starting off, you know, we know First Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, God who will have all men to be saved, and I'm, God is not in the verse, but the, the, the previous verse indicates to us it's God who, whose desires who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. So it's very clear that God's desire is for all men to be what? Saved. saved. How many men? All. all men to be saved and then come to the knowledge of the truth. truth. So that He wants that... Uh, to happen, and that is obviously part of our commission that we have to do. It. If you want to know what's God's will for your life, there it is. He wants all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And so if we get out and do that and, 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 and get on with that, that is, that is us in God's will. Now, in introduction this, morning, uh, this, this evening, if ever there was a group of people, if ever there was a group of people who know the gospel... I'm talking about the technicalities of the gospel, who know the pure gospel, the gospel of God's grace. And more specifically also, who knows, as they know the gospel of God's grace, for you to know the gospel of God's grace perfectly, you also have to understand some things about God's word rightly divided, right? And so who knows God's word also rightly divided, the word of truth, and also who has a Bible that they have, that they believe is God's word, perfect, inerrant, preserved for English-speaking people, our King James Bible, who now holds dear to that Bible, uh, and, 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 and a people that has all these credentials, would you say those people that have all those credentials are most equipped to go out into the world and to make and get on with this business of what God's desire is for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? Now, I have a question. Where would we find a group of people like that? I mean, in, you know, we, we go out, where would we find somebody like that? You know where they are? Sitting right here. And it's not, 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 it's not, you're not the only ones, by the way, so don't get yourself all like, you know, <laughs> we're it. You know, don't get yourself all excited. There's a lot of us out there, okay? But we are the right people to get, a, to get the job done right. Okay? So my challenge is going to be to you. Okay? I don't believe that there's a person here tonight, sitting here tonight, listening on the internet or wherever, um, or listening to the DVD or the, or, the, or the audio later on. I don't believe there's a person here today that does not want to see men and women, children too, come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I, tr I believe that every one of you wants to see people get saved. I believe that, okay? And so I, I know that is that. The question I have, and the thing that I wanted to, to, to say to you is that, you know, if I ask you a question, is when last did you take the time, and you, you don't have to stand up and give your answers or anything, when last did you take the personal time, or I took the personal time, when did we take the personal time, to speak to somebody about the gospel. Or to write just a note to somebody. Or hand somebody just a tract. And to speak to them about their personal salvation. You know, somebody loved me enough one uh, some time ago, uh, way back and in, in, in many, many, many moons ago, um, when I was 15 years old, to share the gospel with me. And I'm glad and, and I appreciate that. But, you know, I, I don't know the person's name. I can't remember his name. I can remember what he looked like. But I don't know his name. But he must have loved me enough or loved the Lord enough and his word enough to share the gospel with somebody. And he shared the gospel. And that night when he shared the gospel, I trusted Christ. Not on what I did, but based on what Christ has done for me. 
And I received the gift of eternal love, uh, life, not based on what I do, not based on what I gave to Him, not based on me turning away from my sin, not based on me praying the sinner's prayer, but completely and ultimately, totally on the finished work of Christ, trusted that, you know, I was a sinner and I was destined for eternal damnation and hell. But here I heard the good news of the grace of God that He extends to me a free gift of salvation. And I trusted Christ that night. And that moment I trusted Christ, that moment I believed the gospel, that moment God, the Spirit of God took me and He baptized me into Christ and He sealed me and I was sealed with that Spirit of promise until the day of redemption. And I'm thankful for that person. We know many, many people in the world that don't know what we know. They don't know how to be saved. You know, you, won't, you, you don't know just how many people around us really, really don't know how to be saved. And there's people around us that really have a desire to know how to be saved. They, 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 they argue in their own minds about it all the time. I've met people like that. And I said, you know, would you mind if I share with you? Sure, I'd like to hear. I want to know. And when you open the Scriptures to them and you share with them, like, wow. You know, they were excited about that. So I want to challenge you tonight to get involved in personal evangelism. You know, I'm not saying... Sh- you know, sell everything that you have and just quit your job and you stand on a corner with a banner up and say, you know, you're going to hell if you don't repent and that type of stuff, you know. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about getting into the Scriptures and let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly and as it works in you, you go out there and share with somebody. When you see there's an opportunity, God will give you a door of utterance to make known the mystery of Christ. You can preach the gospel to people. It's always, you know, the thing is, it's a very intimidating thing. I remember in Kenya, I did a, oh, I used to go to, when I was in Kenya, when I go to Kenya, I have, a, um, I have an evangelism course that I do with them. I share with them how to share the gospel, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, I, know, I remember, the, remember the first time sharing with these guys how to get the gospel out, how to speak to somebody, how to engage somebody into a conversation to hear what, what the status of his soul is so that you can find out if he's saved or not saved. And I said, now, after I share this with you, we're going to go into the streets now and we're going to just speak to people. And they're like, oh, no, 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 no. We don't, and, are you sure? I said, yeah, yeah, I'm going to go with you. Let's just do it. And so I remember the first time we go out, I said, okay, we're going to go out for the first hour, just an hour. And we're going to go share with people and talk to people, and we're going to come back and report back, what did you, what did you get? What, is it, what, what was the response from the people? What did you hear from him? The first hour went by. And about two hours later, the first guys start trailing back with big old smiles on their faces, you know. And they just got over that hurdle of just opening up and started talking to people. Now, some people tell them to go away, just get lost, and what have you. That you expect, that happens. But there's some people that did listen. And there's some people that gave him an ear, and they were able to share with him. And when they got over that hurdle, they were ready to go. So I want to encourage you to get on with that and, and to be motivated to do that, Okay. When it comes to us to execute, execute this issue of going out and sharing with people the gospel, whether it's family members, whether it's close friends, whether it's just strangers, sometimes um, we lose focus, commitment, and a little bit of motivation to do so. We're scared sometimes. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of love and power of a sound mind, right? And uh, we can do it, okay? We just lose a little bit of focus as our local churches too, our local churches, I think of our local church and when I was giving this assignment and I was thinking, wow, you know, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a great assignment, taking God's grace to the world and, and about soul winning in the local based church evangelism and I'm thinking, wow, my church, and not my church, but our church, the, the local church that we have, we can do more than what we are doing, Okay. And, um, and we should get more involved, and we need to encourage our churches. And I trust tonight that what's going to motivate you is not me telling you to do it. But what will motivate us is the Word of God as we look some Scriptures and see what is God doing and what is His desire for us to do. This week you listen to all these messages, great messages. And, and, and if I ask you to sh- put your hands up, if any one of you that has been edified this week and encouraged by the messages, you put your hand up this evening. And so you... Okay, there's one person. All right, great. Uh, <coughs> Preachers that's here still, you guys messed up, okay? The only one guy that's got edified at the back there. But 
But you were edified in it. You were encouraged by the message. You were encouraged by the fellowship. And, 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 and you know what? You were strengthened in the Lord. And, and you were, you know, you learned about God, what God is doing for you through His grace. You have something that you've learned this week that you can go out and share with somebody else. Right? And so and Richard's been talking about if you want to have this week over, just do what you do it this week over next week. And so next week, you don't have all the conference guys, but guess what? You have a lot of other people you're going to rub shoulders with that you can talk to. And so I hope tonight that just through some of the scriptures that you'll be encouraged um, uh, and by some of them, okay? First of all, for us to get more involved in personal uh, 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 soul winning, we need to renew our minds. Our minds need to be renewed. And the way that our minds are going to be renewed is going to have to be renewed in the word of truth. Go with me, if you will, to the book of Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. In Romans chapter 12, we'll just read the first um, two verses there. And <clears throat> there... But there's a transformation process that's going on in our minds. It needs to go on in our minds. And Paul writes out, and he starts off verse 1 then, and, and chapter 12. I beseech you, therefore, brethren. This is the believers that's in Rome, in the churches of Rome. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your what is the next two words you see there? Reasonable service. He doesn't say unreasonable service. It is your reasonable service. From God to expect you and to inspire these words, it's reasonable for God to give you because He's given you an information from Romans chapter 1 to Romans chapter 11 that equips you with the basics of what you need to be, the fundamentals of the finished work of Christ Jesus on the cross of Calvary. And that, that is enough for you to present your body as a living sacrifice as your reasonable service. Do you get that? Then he carries on and says, and be not conformed to this world. That means... It is possible for these believers, these brethren, to be conformed to this world. But he says, be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed. Now, how are we going to be transformed as believers? Well, the Bible says here, by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God? We've just learned what's God's perfect will in First Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. It's for all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Okay? So if we want to prove what is good and perfect and acceptable will of God, what do we need to do? We renew our minds. And where do you renew your mind? In the Word of God. Because it's a living word, it's a word that's alive, it's a word that works in us effectually, it's a word that, re a word that reads us, and it's a word that when you're dealing with God's word, we are dealing with God Himself. And He is the one that does the transformation process. Not me, not the preacher. But God's word, and God's doing that transformation process, and be transformed the renewing of your mind. You understand some things about the gospel of the cross. You understand some things about your justification by faith. You understand some things about, you know what, the condemnation of man. You understand some things about, 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 about your being justified. That all, first of all, that all a sinner comes short of the glory of God. Then you understand some things, how God justifies you by faith. And you understand some issues about your sanctification, how God takes you and sets you aside, and your ultimate glorification. Then he also tells you, by the way, where's Israel then in all of this? Chapters 9 to 11. And he says, now, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Get on with it, that you may prove it. What is a good, good and, and, and acceptable and perfect will of God. There is where the motivation is going to come from. Go with me to Philemon. The book of Philemon is the last, uh, 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 one of the last of in Paul's order here in, 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 in Paul's letters. And Philemon is a co-laborer in Colossa. And we'll possibly come back to this passage a little later, and if time permits, for us to do so. And Philemon, and um, verse, from verse 4, we just read there quickly. He says, I thank my God, making mention of thee always in my prayers. Do you think Paul was lying when he said that? No, he wasn't. Hearing of thy love 
and faith which thou hast towards the Lord Jesus and towards and toward all saints that and he says I, in his prayers he says that the communication of thy faith what you believe the doctrine etc that the communication of thy faith may become effectual by the acknowledging of every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus how is Philemon's communication of his faith going to become effectual by the acknowledging says the scripture of every good thing which is in you in who Woo! Huh? Just acknowledge it. And where do you find it? In God's Word. And you read it and you study it and you find out who God has made you to be. This morning I spoke to the teens about their identity that they have in Christ. When you acknowledge that identity, acknowledge what God gives us, it become, it, then it becomes effectual. And, my, and the communication of my faith becomes effectual because I have something to communicate. Now if you don't know who you are in Christ... You don't have much to communicate. But if you have the experience and understanding of what God has made us to be in Christ, guess what? Oh, you've got a lot to share. Right? They can't take that away from you. Because you know it. You're living it. And you see the transformation in your mind. And, the, and now, because you acknowledge Acknowledge every good thing which is in you in Christ Jesus. Your communication of your faith, it becomes effectual. We're going to come back to this passage possibly a little bit later. But let's go back to 2 Corinthians where we, just, where we were just reading. And let's go through that passage a little bit there. And let's see what Paul says there in the issue of the motivation and the renewing of our minds. We don't have the time to go through the whole passage, which, you know, the ideal thing will be to go from verse 1, and, you know, and, and then you say, when you start verse 1, he says, you know, actually, we'd better start in chapter 4. Oh, no, no, let me go, let's go back to, but that is something you're going to teach your local churches, and you have to go in your own personal time through. But in chapter 5, verse 14, he says, for the love of Christ, for the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if, if one died for all, then we're all what? We know all we're dead, right? We understand it from the Scriptures. The Scriptures have concluded it for us in the book of Romans. And he says now, but he says now we understand some things about the love of Christ. And when we understand this issue of the love of Christ, what He's done for us, um, and, and, and verse 15 says, and that He died for all, and that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto Him that died for them and rose again. So we understand that He died for us, He was buried and He rose again, Right? When we, and that we understand the reason why God did it was because it's the love. And so what happens when we get that and we acknowledge this every good thing that we have in Christ Jesus, the love of Christ does what? It constrains you. And that word constrains there, the way that I understand it in my simplicity of my mind is to, to hold together, to arrest, to preoccupy, preoccupy and force us the Afrikaans word is drung, drung, you know. And I wish I can explain to you drung, but it's just not, you're not going to get it, you know. It's just so much, oh, I must be careful what I say, because if I say it's much more meaningful than one, then uh, I'm in trouble. By the way, Afrikaans is a language you'll speak in heaven one day, if you don't want to wonder. <laughs> but uh, but it, 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 it preoccupies you, it, take, it, it takes hold of you. And it motivates you now. Because it constrains you. When you're constrained by something, you've seen that one of these, uh, it's maybe not a good example, but a python when it constrains an animal, a small animal. Where's the animal going to go to? No, no. He's subject to what that snake's going to do with him. And so when we get this, we get this understanding of what Christ died for us, was buried and rose again, and acknowledges the love of Christ constrains, constraineth us, it takes hold of us. It arrests us. And we live unto Him that died for us. Look at verse 40. It says, For the love of Christ constraineth us, because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we're all dead. And that He died for all. 
that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto Him which died for them and rose again. So now we're not living unto ourselves anymore, but we live unto who? Unto Christ, who what? Who died for us. He's not saying, here, okay guys, uh, you know, Jesus died for you, so go live for Him, go do things for Him. No. When you get what He did for you in His death, burial, and resurrection, His love constrains you, and guess what? Henceforth, you just now live for Him. It's not, a, it's not a matter of a question, hey, you know, you should do that. No, when the love of Christ constrains you, guess what you're going to do? You're going to live for Him. And you're going to live unto Him. That's a natural process. And that He died for all those 15, that they which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto Him which died for them and rose again. Wherefore, henceforth know we may, no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, Yet now henceforth know we Him no more. Verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ. Who's that? Believers. That's us. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become what? We have a new identity. We're a new creature. We're not that old creature anymore. You get that? Verse 18 says, All things are become new. The last part of verse 17 says, Verse 18 says, And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us, that you and I, believers in the body of Christ, believers, reconciled us to Himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us, the ministry of what? Reconciliation. So all things are of God who hath reconciled us to Himself. I didn't reconcile myself to God. I didn't come one day and say, you know, God, you know, there's some sin separating up, so I'm going to do something about this, and I'm going to get myself to you, and we're going to make peace through the blood of, uh, uh, not through the blood of God. We're going to make peace on my terms, what I'm going to do here. No, no. He said, I saw you have a problem and an issue of sin separating you from me, and I'm going to make a provision for your sin in my son who's going to die for you on that cross, pay for your sin on that cross, who's going to die, and then if he dies, he's going to be buried and rose the third day again for your justification, and I'm going to reconcile you through the blood of my son. And he reconciles us to himself. He brings us to himself. By Jesus Christ, the finished work of Christ, as is, and hath given to us the ministry of what? What is that ministry of reconciliation? There was one day that I was lost as, as, a, as, as one of our brothers has, has, has gone on to be with the Lord now. He said, I was lost like a ball in tall grass. Daryl Mephit used to say that. No, it doesn't sound so nice when I say it because I don't have that twang that he had it with, you know. <laughs> But I was lost. I was dead in trespasses and sins. And then somebody told me that as God loved me so much, He gave His Son. And, and, and His Son came and God commended His love toward me while I was yet a sinner. Christ died for me. And I heard the gospel. And I trusted Christ that He did for me. And that moment I got saved and God reconciled me to Himself. And everybody in the body of Christ the same. That's God's ultimate purpose, not just for you and I as members of the body of Christ into the heavens, but also for the earth, through the nation of Israel. And He's given to us the ministry of what? Reconciliation. Now, yes, the ministry, part of this ministry of reconciliation, He says, verse 19, to wit. Now, uh, you know, me, first language Afrikaans, English, the second language, to wit. First thing I think about is witness. But that's not what the word wit means. The wit means, to my understanding is, it means to know. To know some things. To understand some things. To wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto Himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us, to, to, us, to us the word of reconciliation. So what is it that's been committed to us? We have the ministry of reconciliation. And where do we find out what the ministry of reconciliation is? He committed us to the word of what? 
of reconciliation. God's Word tells us about His plan of reconciliation. And when you and I get it, we can teach the world out there about God reconciling the world to Himself, not imputing their trespasses to them. As we get God's Word and, 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 we, and, and we get it, Then he says in verse 20, and, you know, not, and, and purposefully not spending a lot of time on any, which, each one of these verses explaining them because we don't have the time for that. But in verse 20 he says, Now then, he's speaking to this church at, at Corinth, he says, Now then, we, the body of Christ, are ambassadors for Christ. Paul speaking about it, obviously in the first person there. We are ambassadors for Christ as though God beseech you, by us, we pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. Get this word of reconciliation. He says, we're ambassadors for Christ. You and I, in our commission that we have, we are ambassadors for Christ. An ambassador is quite a calling. What a calling. To, ambassador, to be an ambassador for Christ. An ambassador means to represent another and to speak on his behalf of another or an official representative or spokesperson of, of an organization, of a country, of a representation. We are, repre are ambassadors for Christ. We represent him here because Paul says in the next part of that verse, we pray you in Christ's stead. As ambassadors for the Lord, we, not, we have an ambassadorship not just to a nation, but our ambassadorship is going to go and it's going to be ministering. And our ministry of, uh, and as ambassadors is to a every man ministry, a representation to every man. We have a worldwide grace commission. That's what we have to go into the whole world. And to preach to every man the word of reconciliation. The finished work of Christ and their behalf, that God's not imputing their trespasses unto them. And He's committed to us that word, and we need to go and preach it out there. We have a worldwide grace commission. You know, the 12th, and, I, and I, it would be great to have the time. I've got 17 minutes here, I need to stop talking about the time, but let's move on. Um, we have. The twelfth, at the end of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, after the Lord Jesus Christ died, is resurrected, he spends 40 days with them, he gives them a commission as they're going to go out there, and what, we, what, the, what the church, or what we generally know as people out there, denominationalism, etc., knows as the Great Commission. Let me tell you something, there's nothing wrong with that commission. It was a Great Commission. But it's not our commission. Okay? That's not our ministry. That was their ministry. And their ministry told them also to go into all the world. To every nation. But their ministry was to specifically, as before, before the, at, at, to, to, until the, the second coming of the Lord, until the nation of Israel is established in the kingdom as the priesthood of God and God's holy nation and establishes them, until then, their ministry is going to be to every Israelite in the whole world. God's not sending him out to the Jew and then to the Gentile. That's not their commission is the way I understand it. He's sending him out to go into all the far world and starting at Jerusalem and bring and get the message to Israel because they're all over. Bring them back. When it gets established in the kingdom, then they can go out. Then the message, the blessing is going to go out to the Gentiles. You and I, on the other hand, so their ministry was, Matthew chapter 20, verse 28 says the following. It says, Even as the Son of Man came, in, came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and gave His life a ransom for what? For many. Not for all. For many. It was very clear when Jesus Christ came in the introduction of Luke chapter 1 and Matthew chapter 1. He says He came to save His people from their sin, to redeem His people and to bring salvation to His people. That was the message. Before it could go out to the world, ultimately the blessings will go to the, to the Gentiles, but it's not going to go to the Gentiles until Israel is established and the kingdom is established and the king sits on his throne. Do you get that? You and I, on the other hand, go with me to 
First Timothy chapter two. First Timothy chapter two. <coughs> In First Timothy chapter two, verse four. This is the passage we talked about earlier. Who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all. Not many, but for a ransom for who? All to be testified in due time. Let me tell you, it's due time. He needs to be testified. Testify, you know. You guys know, some, some of you know what I'm talking about. But we need to testify Him. It's, it's, it, and, 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 and God's reckon, uh, oh, sorry, verse 6 says, Who gave Himself a ransom for all. Our ministry is to every man. We have an every man ministry, all, all, every man in this world. Go with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, if you will. And we're coming back to 2 Corinthians, by the way. Ephesians chapter 3. And for time's sake, I'm not going to read all the verses, but I'd like to start in verse 1, but we're not going to go in verse 1. Verse 7 says, Whereof I was made a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given unto me by the effectual working of His power. Unto me, who am less than the least of all the saints, is this grace given, that I should preach among the Gentiles, what? The unsearchable riches of Christ. Untraceable, unfind. You can't find them. It was hidden God. And so to preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and and to make what? All men see what is the fellowship of the mystery which from the beginning of the world hath been hid hid in God who created all things by Jesus Christ. So if Paul says this year is to preach the unsearchable riches of Christ to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, the twelfth message to preach to to to, to Israel first and starting in Jerusalem and going to, to every nation their message was known since the world began. Paul's message has been kept secret since the world began. God hid it in himself. He's now revealing this unsearchable riches of, 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 of Christ. And he says, now this, I need to make every man see, all men see, what is the fellowship of the mystery. And if Paul, that was Paul's commission, that was Paul's instruction to do, guess what? You and I, as Paul is our pattern, we have that ministry now so that every man can see what is the fellowship of the mystery. Could you see that that gospel is going to be different to the 12th message that they're going to be preaching? We preach Jesus Christ crucified. We preach His death, His burial, and His resurrection for for our justification. Every man. Go with me to Colossians chapter 1, if you will. Colossians chapter 1. Verse 23 says, If you continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel, which you have heard, and which was preached to every, what? Creature. Now, remember the Bible says we're a new creature? So the message preached to every creature, and when every creature hears the gospel, responds to the gospel, trusts Christ, he becomes a new creature. Right? It says, preach to every creature. That every creature, Paul says, and it's not all it's not all without exception. He didn't say, I found every person that ever could live in that time and speak to every one of them. No, the issue is there. He speak to all without distinction. He didn't say, are you a Jew? Are you, are you a Gentile? Sorry, I can't speak to you. I need to speak to the Jew first here. No, he, no, there's no distinction who he's going to teach to. Every creature is going to hear this message. You understand what I'm saying? We have an every man ministry. Now go with, back with me to 2 Corinthians, if you will. 2 Corinthians, chapter 5, and verse 20 again. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. That's our, that's our position. That's what we have. Um, that's our role. And now we're ambassadors. That's our job function, if you will. Now we're ambassadors for Christ. As though God beseech you by us, we pray you in Christ's stead. That word, in Christ's stead there. We pray you in Christ's stead, be reconciled to God. In Christ's stead, in the behalf of, or in place of, the Lord Jesus Christ is not present here. He's not, but He's, he's in us. We're in Him. 
right? And who is the representative's representation and speaks on the behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ today? We do. We're in his stead. And we have a ministry to do, and we have a ministry to say, Richard was speaking earlier about the imminent return, return of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we don't know how long it's going to be. And we sure have to get on with it and, and redeem the time. Because we don't know how long it is anymore. And we need to get on with it. Because people, there's a lost people out there, there's a whole world lost out there that need to hear the gospel. <laughs> Now, interesting, verse 20 says, Now we are then ambassadors for Christ, as though God who seeks you by us. We pray you in Christ's stead, be ye reconciled to God. For he, that, and that's God, he hath made him, against a further explanation, for he hath made him, that's Jesus Christ, to be sin for us. Who knew no sin, that he might be made the righteousness, that, 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 sorry, that, sorry, that we might be made the righteousness of, of God in Him. Wow. You know, simplistic verse. I'm just reading. He says, For He hath made Him to be sin for us. And I'm thinking about that fact that one that moment, one moment in time, um, I don't know who spoke about it this week. I can't remember which brother spoke about it. Can you imagine that, that that hour before the Lord had to go and He knew He's going to be captured? He's in that garden and He's... And he's sweating, it's sweat, it's of drop comes off his brow, and he's praying, Lord, if it's possible that the cup pass me by, but not my will, but thy will be done. What the Son of Man has gone through at that moment, because he's not just going to die a simplistic death, he's going to die for the sin of all men. And God the Father at that moment is going to make him to be sin. And he's going to forsake him at that moment. And He made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin. Why? Why? That we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. God, when we trust the gospel, when we trust the minister, the the word of reconciliation, when we hear the word of reconciliation, the finished work of Christ on Calvary for us, that 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 He paid for us and was made sin for us, died for us, was buried, rose again the third day, according to the Scriptures. That moment I, I believe God imputes to me Christ's righteousness. Did I deserve it? Did I earn it? I just got it as a free gift. And there's people out there that don't know that. They're working for their salvation and they're beating themselves up every day because they think they're failing and they're not making it. And guess what? They're not making it. And you and I, as the ambassadors in Christ's state, need to get out there with this ministry, this, with the, 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 the revelation of the mystery. We need to get out there with the gospel of God's grace and tell Him, listen, you know what? God's not imputing your trespasses unto you. He's paid for your sin. He, he became sin for you so that you can be made righteous. All you need to do is trust Christ. Believe the gospel. Trust Christ. It's simplistic, isn't it? Not complicated. For He hath made Him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. That's how we can get on with that ministry. Now, you know, who becomes an ambassador? The one that gets imputed to righteousness. He's the ambassador. He's the one in Christ's stead now. Because we have imputed right. He's imputed righteousness. Verse four says, uh, chapter 6, verse 1 says, We then as workers together with Him. With who? With Christ. We then work us together with Him and with God. Beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. Don't receive it for nothing. And then he says in, inverted, in, in, com, in, in brackets, in a parenthesis there in, chapter, in verse 2, he says, For he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted. And he's quoting Old Testament scripture in Isaiah chapter 49. For, I, for he said, I have heard thee in a time accepted. In the day of salvation have I secured thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. We receive salvation. It's a day of salvation still. And we live in the dispensation of God's grace. The, day, the night is far spent. The day is at hand. Romans chapter 13. We, get away, we better get on with it. There's an opportunity for people to get saved. Every day of grace before the Lord returns, there's an opportunity for people to get saved. And when it's an opportunity, you and I have a job to do. And sometimes it can be an intimidated job. 
God has entrusted His Word to you and me. He's entrusted to us to the, to the ministry of reconciliation. He's commissioned us with that. He's given us the position of ambassadors. He's given us identity in His Son. He's made us righteous. He made us accepted in the Beloved. And now He entrusts His Word to us. Go with me to First Thessalonians, if you will, chapter 2. First Thessalonians, chapter 2. <coughs> First Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 1 says, For yourselves, brethren, know your entrance in... Uh, 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 sorry. For yourselves, brethren, know our entrance in unto you, that it was not in vain. But even that after we had suffered before and were shamefully entreated, as you know, at Philippi, we were bold in our God to speak unto you the gospel of God with much contention. You know, the issue is when they were speaking the gospel of God to them, was that an easy job? No, it was with much contention. But they did get the gospel through because these guys got saved. Sorry for the pitch in the voice, but <laughs> they got saved. They got saved, okay? <laughs> Verse 3 says, For our ex- exhortation was not of deceit, nor of uncleanness, nor of guile, but as we were allowed of God, God allowed us, enabled us, but we were allowed of God to be put in trust with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God which trieth our hearts. You know what God has done to us? He's entrusted to us. He's, 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 he's allowed us and, and He's imputed righteousness and He put us in trust with the gospel. Now that is almost a scary thing to think about. Not almost. It is a scary thing to think about. That God has put us in trust with the gospel. The, prop, the, the thing that I'm thankful for is, God doesn't say, Des, I'm going to trust the gospel to you, I'm going to put to your trust, and you get on with it, and do what you need to do. Now God says, you know what, as you receive the Christ Jesus your Lord, so walk in Him, guess what? I'm going to enable you, I'm going to give you the sufficiency that you need to do so. You don't have to worry about anything, just trust me, trust my word, I will do the work. I'm thankful for that, because I'll fail. My wife leaves for the day, go to work. I'm working from home. And she entrusts me to do the dishes. Or, no, no, what she normally does, she puts the washing in the first morning before she leaves to put the washing in. And she says, I'll put your trust out to, to take the washing out, put it in the dryer. Don't let it leave in, a, in the washing machine because it's going to smell if it just lays, stays wet in there. No problem, honey. Sure. Love your lots. Go on. She gets home from work, tired, stopped by the shopping bags and everything, walks in there. Did you take the washing out? Oh, oh. Ah, I messed up. And she gives me that look. And then she walks and, um, no, nah, maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> I'd be in trouble. Well, let me tell you, and you can know in the future, when you hear her walk like this, it's all okay. When you hear her walk like this. All right. You get it. I'll suffer the consequences when I get out of here. But he's put us in trust with the gospel. First Timothy chapter 6. First Timothy chapter 6. Verse 20. Whoa, time gone. Oh, Timothy, Paul's writing to Timothy. He's putting Timothy with a, a, a lot of charge there to keep the doctrine and, 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 and the word and because there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a moving away and departing from the doctrine. And, verse, and chapter 1, verse 20 says, Oh, Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust. Keep it. That means guard it that has been committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of signs, false so-called, which some professing have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. He says, keep it. Hold on to it. First, Second Timothy chapter two, uh, chapter one, verse twelve says, "For the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not ashamed, for I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed unto him against that day. Hold fast the form of sound words." He says to Timothy, "Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me in faith and love, which is again in Christ Jesus." 
When you acknowledge that, what you have in Christ Jesus, you can hold on to the form of sound words because He's helping you. It's no longer I that liveth, but Christ that liveth in me. I can hold on to the form of sound words. That form of sound words, the design that God has in His Word and in the doctrine He's laid out for us, and we can hold it on. We entrust it with the gospel, and we need to hold on to that. You see, God has not entrusted to you and me the souls of men and says, you know, oh, you protect those souls of men because you and I can't do anything about the souls of men. But what is entrusted to us is the word of His grace. And the the job that you and I have as ambassadors in Christ's stead and the ministry that we have is to preach the gospel. God will do the job with Him. You and I just have to preach the word, He says. And, 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 yeah, I know, it's gone. And I'm not even to the church, but I'm going to jump a bunch of stuff here and just give you some verses here quickly. But 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. The souls of men are God's business. Don't forget that. I charge thee before the Lord, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead that is appearing in his kingdom. Preach the what? Word. Be instant in season, out of season, and in season, out of season. That means that it doesn't matter what season it is. What do you need to do? Preach the word. Whether you're fearful or not fearful, guess what? Preach the word. Out of season, reprove and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap themselves teachers having itching ears, and they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But watch thou in all things. Endure afflictions. Guess what? Afflictions is going to come. Not maybe. It will come. You make a stand for the truth. You preach a pure gospel. You will be afflicted. Guaranteed. But watch thou in all things. Endure affliction. Do the work of an evangelist. A work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry. That means to fulfill your ministry. Be a herald of salvation. Preach it. Preach the cross. Oh, there's so many verses I just want, want to just, that we could just go in here, but our, our time is up. In the local church, your local church needs to be a place where, where, where this is, this is, this is um, cultivated and where we as preachers and ministers and, 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 and whoever's ministering in the local church, we need to encourage our people with this very important task of evangelism and the issue of, of getting the lost souls of men to hear the gospel of God's grace. And we need to cultivate it. There's a last example. I'm going to close off with this. And um, <clears throat> You know, you would think a person will learn through the years as you preach. Not to have too much stuff. But it works every time. I don't know. Your other preachers, you know. I never get through my notes. You know, maybe I'm not a good calculator of this stuff. But anyway, um, what am I saying? What was I saying? First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians. I'm going to read you this passage here in closing. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 1. Paul and Sophanus and Timotheus unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love, and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ, in the sight of God and our Father, knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God. For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost. So you know, we preach the word, but guess what? God adds to that power and in the Holy Ghost. And with much assurance, as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake, and ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that ye were what? And samples to some, no, to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of God, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith to God word is spread abroad that we 
need not speak anything. Paul says, you know what? I don't have to go and preach the gospel here. Guess what? When you got it, you got it. And let's start working in you effectually, chapter 2, verse 13. And I know here's some of these guys. You know, here's some of the guys here that, that give me a hard time because I quote 1 Thessalonians 2, 13 all the time. I'm not going to mention names. Charlie, Mike. Um, <laughs> but it's a great verse. And it worked effectually in them. And when they heard it, from them sounded out the word of the Lord, verse 8, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but to God and but in every place, your faith to God would have spread abroad so that we need not speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God. When these guys got out there, they were not just preaching. They were preaching to people that were serving idols and was deep, grounded, and rooted in idolatry. But they got the message. They got the word of God's grace. They got the, what Christ did for them. And it, and it worked in them. And they accepted. They acknowledged what they had in Christ. And they went out there and preached the word. And these people in these areas got saved and responded to the gospel. And that's what you and I need to do. We need to get it first before we get it out there. And to wait for His Son from heaven, whom He raised from the dead, even Jesus which delivered us from the wrath to come. I honestly don't think I did justice to the subject here tonight with um, the information that I want to share with you, but I do want to encourage you. The information that we heard this week, don't just hear it this week. Most of you will sit here and take notes. Go home and go over those. Go read these scriptures again. Go, go search the scriptures where these things so Consider it. Get, it. get it grounded in your heart. Acknowledge it. Every good thing that's, with you, that's in you in Christ Jesus. Acknowledge that. So that the communication of your faith can become effectual. And people can hear the gospel. Encourage your local ministries and your pastors. Whatever you need to do to get the message out, to get it out there. But remember, the basis for every all ministry should be in a local church. And from that, look, it should have sounded out. That happened in Thessalonians, a local church, and they sounded it out. And so it should be sounded out for our local churches. That doesn't mean you as an individual can't share the gospel. You should be sharing the gospel because you're part of a local church. You're a member of the body of Christ. But let's get on out there and let's make it a new commitment to make, make sure the gospel gets preached. If there's anyone here tonight that's never trusted Christ, never heard that your sins was completely, completely, ultimately, totally paid for on Calvary, that God commanded His love, that word commanded His love, He put it on open display, His love for you. And while we're here at sinners, Christ died for you, for us. Won't you trust Christ tonight? First, there's... And, and, and Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, and we're closing here this, this evening. And first, and, and why don't you trust Christ and believe the gospel? In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 13, we're not going to ask you to walk the line. We're not going to ask you to come up the line. And like the piano player, would you come up now and get, get us ready for an altar call here? Start playing the songs very clearly. Just as I am. Wanna, you see, nobody asked me to sing. Um, <laughs> And, and start getting you emotionally wiped up, uh, uh, swiped up and getting you in here. When you sit here and you hear the gospel of Jesus Christ died for your sins, was buried for your, and erased for your justification, and you know that you're a sinner and you're on your way to a, a, eternal damnation, you trust Christ for eternal salvation, receive the gift of eternal life, that moment that you believe it in your heart and you accept it, and you made it personal and acknowledge that that moment <laughs> you got translated from death to life. Why don't you do that? Why do you want to walk around dead? Be alive. Life is yours in Christ Jesus. In, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 says, In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, that's as Paul preached it, in whom also after that ye believed, he was sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance 
until the redemption of the purchased possession, that's the body of Christ, you and I, unto the praise of His glory, sealed for eternity, paid fully and complete. Just trust it. Believe it, hear it, believe it, trust it. Place your faith in Christ, and the faith of Christ will save you and give you eternal life. Amen. Amen. Father, we thank you tonight for your word. And Lord, there's so much that we can still study out about this, but we thank you for the simplicity that is in Christ, for the ministry that you've given us, the encouragement that we received this week from your word, from the various preachers and the ministry, just the fellowship of saints together. Thank you for edifying us. Thank you for the word of your grace that builds us up. Thank you for our blessed hope as we look for that glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> Thank you for the work you're doing in us by your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. All right. Well, we've come to the end.